Good morning. Good morning, Mother. Why don't we sing to our lady a little bit before we begin our talk? Father mentioned the theme of my reflection is this is a time of Mary. It seems so easy, but it was a little complicated to put it together. <laughs> um, but it was also a profound reflection, not only of the times that we live in, but also to enter deeply into the contemplation of what a lady is doing in this, her time. In Isaiah 16, we hear, I, the Lord, will swiftly accomplish the things when the time has come. The word of the Lord. From Genesis, all through the Old Testament, Everything took place at the appointed time to prepare humanity for the fullness of time, the incarnation of the Son of God. It was in the soul of history that God chose to establish a covenant with Israel and so prepare the birth of his Son from the virginal and pure womb of our Blessed Mother. That is the fullness of time. His incarnation is, as John Paul II told us in Novo Milenio in Eunte, number five, the pulsating heart of time. Isn't that a beautiful description? The pulsating heart of time, the mysterious hour in which the kingdom of God came to us, but indeed took root in our history. In Novo Milenio at Peniente, one year after, he said, in Christianity, time has a fundamental importance. Within the dimension of time, the world was created. Within time, the history of salvation unfolds, finding its culmination in the fullness of time. But also the goal of time is a glorious return of the Son of God at the end of time. With the incarnation, with the coming of Christ, began the last days, the last hour, and also the time of the church, which will last until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul reminds us in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time has come, God sent his only son, born of a woman. The incarnation is the turning point of man's history. It is the central event, the key event of the history of salvation. But Our Lady, and we're gonna give a round of applause to Our Lady, okay? Our Lady is that woman who is present in the central salvific event of humanity. She is at the center of the fullness of time. Actually, the incarnation, this event was realized in her and through her, and that's why she has a precise place and a precise mission in the plan of salvation, Mother of the Redeemer, number one. She is at the center of the event of salvation, and that event was realized in her and through her because 
She exercised her maternal mission. And from that moment, all the events in the plan of salvation will be realized in her and through her for humanity because she has been given the mission to be the mother of the church. And I love like when Paul VI consecrated at the end of the Second Vatican Council, consecrated the church to a lady after proclaiming her as a mother of the church. I love the way he said it. She is the mother of the Pope. She is the mother of bishops. She is the mother of priests. She is the mother of religious men and women, and she is the mother of the lady. Why did he specify it so deeply? So no one can say she is not my mother. She is the mother of the church. And she exercises her maternal mission on the church in every historic moment. Her intervention becomes more visible, more tangible, especially when the times are darker, more dangerous, when great shadows threaten her children, and many are at risk of losing their eternal salvation because they have lost faith. She makes herself present when she sees the widespread spiritual and moral decadence that prevails in a culture, in our families, in society, sometimes even in some sectors of the church. And in every person, she comes in many forms to intervene in these historic moments to crush the evil of sin, to crush the evil of confusion, even of rejection of God and his commandments. She comes to crush the head of the serpent by calling us as a mother to abandon the ways of darkness. She comes to confront the evils of our times through her teaching as a formator, as an educator of the human person, but also with the mediation of grace that destroys the works of Satan. She comes to teach us also the consequences of sin, the possible ways of destruction, as Dr. Mark Mirabal said, she has come to warn us of great chastisements if we don't change our way of life. As we see from the words of the Proto-Gospel, the victory of the woman's son will take place without, not without a hard struggle. So if you want to live an easy Christianity, you're not Christian. We are in a battle, and we will be in battle until the end of time, or until our personal end of time, that's when we die. A struggle, John Paul II said, that extends through the whole of human history. This enmity foretold at the beginning is confirmed in Revelation, the book of the final events of the church and the world, in which she appears as a woman clothed with the sun, confronting whom? The dragon with seven heads. I think we have, like, we have the dragon now like with 70 heads. Mary is a mother of the Word incarnate, and she's placed at the very center of this enmity, of this struggle that accompanies, said John Paul, the history of humanity on earth and the history of salvation itself. Yeah, our blessed mother, is a luminous sign, the woman clothed with the sun that comes to confront the darkness of Satan. 
The history of men has been marked by the maternal intervention of Our Lady, especially by her mission along her son during his life on earth and his passion, death, and resurrection. That's why she's the Corredentrix. Yet her interventions continue and, in fact, have taken on a new importance and prominence in the last 200 years. Just as the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, the Lord was born of a woman in order to accomplish his salvific mission, she now advances, defends, protects this mission through her maternal power and authority during this Marian era or Marian time. As St. Paul VI has defined in these years that are characterized by the powerful presence of Our Lady. He even said by a strong Marian spirit and activity. St. Paul VI, in his apostolic exhortation given to us in the 50th anniversary of Fatima, May 13, 1967, Signum Magnum, he said, we have entered into the Marian era. And then Pope Pius XII, when he gave us this exceptional encyclical, Acelli Regina, he said, she's not only our mother, but she's also our queen. She's the partner of redemption. She's the partner in the work of salvation, and she will continue to be until the end of times. It's beautiful that Paul VI said in this encyclical where he was establishing the liturgical feast of a lady as queen, he said, Paul VI said, we have entered the Marian era. Pius XII said in this encyclical, we had entered the era of the queenship of Mary. And when we speak of queenship, we are speaking of a woman that has authority, that has power to influence, a power to give orders, and that's why we need to listen to a lady if we want to really be victorious in this battle. There was a great prophet, a prophetic saint of this Marian era, and I'm sure you all know about him, San Luis, San Luis of Montfort, who in his book, True Devotion to Mary, not only spoke of the coming era of Mary, he wasn't writing it for his times. He was writing it for our times. So he spoke of the coming era of Mary and also described the effects and the purpose of this era of Our Lady, this time of Our Lady. But also he had a prophetic intuition the intuition that the devil was going to hide the book. By the way, the book was hidden for 130 years. Can you imagine 130 years how many generations did not read True Devotion to Mary? We have to think about that to understand our times and our responsibility. But the Lord in its precise appointed time because the Lord of history is Jesus Christ. That book wasn't hidden forever. In the precise moment when humanity needed to understand more than ever the person, identity, and mission of a lady, the book was discovered. In 1946. Why is that important? Because according to 18, I'm sorry, 1846, according to 
saints and Marian holy popes. The Marian era began with the apparition of a lady in Paris, the Miraculous Medal. When did that apparition take place? 1830. Then we had later La Salette, then Lourdes, and then all the Marian apparitions that we have up to our present time. But when the Marian era is beginning, what does the Lord do? They have to understand what this means. So let me get the book of St. Louis of Montfort out. You see, everything takes place in the appointed time. We needed to understand what was happening. Why is Our Lady appearing so much? We need to understand why the battles have increased. We needed to understand what is our responsibility before this grace. And all of that is written in true devotion to Mary. Our Lady had to be known and loved, said um, San Luis of Montfort, more than ever in the latter times. That's the expression that he uses, the latter times. Precisely, I believe that the Lord is, gave us a book which is not only a masterpiece of Mariology, but also led us into one of the most powerful means to be inside and within the Immaculate Heart of Mary sitting at the School of Our Lady and be informed to be an apostle of Our Lady for these times. And what is that powerful mean? Total consecration to Our Lady. Well, the Lord explained to us through the book what is total consecration when years after, during the first world war, we never had world worlds except in the 20th century. Our Lady appeared in Fatima, and what did she ask? Pray the rosary every day. I wish all Catholics will obey her. We will have a different world. But also she said, there's so many evils coming, so many threats coming. Consecrate the world and consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary because it is the desire of my son, not my desire, the desire of my son to establish in the world the devotion to the Immaculate Mary. And my heart will be your refuge. When do we need a refuge? When we are in danger. My Immaculate Heart will be your refuge and the sure path that will lead you to God. You know, between Fatima and true devotion to Mary, there's so many words that are common. For St. Louis and Montfort, Consecration was a powerful tool to advance the triumph of the Immaculate Heart that will bring about the triumph of the Sacred Heart of our Lord, of His Eucharistic Heart. For St. Louis de Montfort, if Our Lady was at the heart of the Incarnation, at the heart of the coming of Christ to the world, she was indispensable, not optional indispensable to bring about the reign of Christ in the world. He said it is through the most blessed Virgin Mary that Jesus Christ came into the world. It is through her that he must reign in all hearts and in the world. We have a lot of work to do, brothers and sisters. The key to help a lady accomplish this in humanity is prayer, total consecration, but also to do what 
Our Lady asked Sister Lucia, we have to become Sister Lucia today. The Lord wants to make me known and loved. We have to put all of our efforts in teaching and revealing who is Our Lady. You know, the four first dogmas, they speak about the identity of Our Lady. The dogma that we're waiting for and working for it speaks about the mission of Our Lady. And a person has identity and mission. We need to say, like St. Louis of Mon for summarize his consecration, because when we do the consecration, it's a long one, isn't it? But he summarized it in four, in four phrases. I belong entirely to you, dear mother, and all that I have is yours. I take you as my own, give me your heart. We can repeat that the whole day, and we're reconsecrating constantly. Actually, St. John Paul II, when they were studying, uh, the postulator was telling me that they found he always wrote, not in computer, he wrote by hand. And in every uh, page, he will put, like at the beginning of the page, I am all yours, Mary. Second page, all that I have is yours. Third page, I take you as my own. Fourth page, give me your heart. And then he will repeat it. Consecrating every page that he wrote to the Blessed Mother. With these simple phrases, and Luis Maria Grignon de Montfort composed the most powerful total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And in her, and through her, and through her heart. Why through her heart? Because it's the heart that has been in an indivisible communion with the heart of the Redeemer, with his person and his mission, salvific mission. Our Lord, wants to save humanity. We need saving. I don't know if you pray that, but I find myself, Lord, save us. Lord, save us. Protect us. Defend us. Keep us with a clear mind in such a time of confusion and relativism. We need a lot to pray for salvation. And the Lord wants to save us, but he has chosen, as he, Jacinta said before dying, the Lord has entrusted these times to our Blessed Mother, and she has a mission to convert the world. Is that an easy mission? That's a hard mission. We cannot even convert people that we know. She has a mission to convert the world, and she has the mission to return the world to the heart of her son. But she cannot do it alone. That's what she told Lucia. Jesus needs you to make me known and love and to establish devotion to my Immaculate Heart. We have to become, what I'm gonna speak later, the apostles of the Blessed Mother. For St. John Paul II, consecration was crucial to manifest the power of Mary to intervene in human history. And where did he say it? Giving a retreat to Paul VI and the Curia in 1976. He said, precisely when the church feels the grace attacks of the enemy, precisely when the mystical body of Jesus is in total contradiction to the spirit of the world and Satan. In those periods of history, the particular need of entrustment of ourselves to Mary is felt. And in crossing the threshold of hope, he says, if the victory comes, it will come through Mary. Christ will conquer but will conquer through her because he wants the church victories now and at the future to be linked to her. So we can ask a question, why now? Why now Jesus wants that all the victories of the church are totally linked 
to a lady and we can visibly identify it. Well, Luc Sister Lucia had the same question because Jesus asked for the consecration of Russia to avoid all the errors and all the persecutions and all the difficult times, even the Second World War. And so he asked Jesus, why is the consecration so con in unconditional? I mean, why do you want the consecration? And Jesus says, because I want my whole church to recognize that consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary brings about all my triumphs so that later on my church will extend the devotion to the Immaculate Heart and place it right along to the devotion to the Sacred Hearts. I mean, the era of the two hearts. Therefore, the Marian era is marked by the recognition of the power of Our Lady to bring about the triumphs of Christ in all the battles of our history. The fruit of the, her victory will be the conversion of many souls, the triumph of the Eucharistic heart of Christ, the splendor of the church. That was the prophecy of the charismatic renewal in 1975. Dark days are coming to the church. But then a time of glory will come. We have seen the first part, isn't it? We're waiting for the second. And that will be brought by the intervention of Our Lady. The Second Vatican Council declared in its closing message a powerful message. I love it. All women should love it. The hour is coming. In fact, has come. Isn't that powerful? That's the authority of the church saying that. When the vocation of women is being acknowledged in its fullness, when the hour in which women acquire in the world an influence, effect, and power. Don't forget those three words. Influence, effect, and power. Never before achieved. That is why at this moment, when the human race is undergoing so deep a transformation, and not so good a transformation in many areas, women imbued with the spirit of the gospel can do so much to aid humanity in not falling. It's not just any women, I want to be clear. This is not feminism, this is an authentic Christian feminine genius. It's not any woman. It's not the hour for just any woman. It's the hour for women imbued with the spirit of the gospel that can help humanity in not falling. Brothers and sisters, if it is a time for all women imbued with the spirit of the gospel to influence effect and exercise all the power of the feminine genius for the good of humanity. I think we can deduce this is a time of the woman per excellence, totally imbued with the spirit of the gospel that the gospel, the word made flesh, was in her womb. She is the one that can influence, effect, and use all her power for, to help humanity from not falling. Falling away from God. Falling from the authentic meaning of life. The Lord has entrusted, said John Paul II and Mulieris Dignitatem, the human person to women. But more than ever, I think that the Lord has entrusted all of humanity to the woman who is the Blessed Mother. So why do we have a Marian era? Why do we have a time of Mary? 
What is that of a time of Mary? It's a particular time within salvation history of universal significance and influence in which our Blessed Mother is given the power and prophetic mission. By what power? Maternal power and authority to exercise her maternity and queenship over all humanity. With what purpose? To save souls, to bring into conversion, prayers, sacraments, to the word of God, to his commandments, and to live according to the evangelical values of the kingdom. I think all of us have experienced that Our Lady is active. She's moving. She's moving her finger and directing many things. She is intervening in our history. And she's reminding us to this materialistic world. And materialistic is not only love for material things. Materialistic world is a world that believes that this is the end that what we see is the truth, have lost a sense of transcendence. A lady is coming to speak about a supernatural origin and eschatological end. That's why many of the children who have had apparitions, they see hell, they see heaven, they see purgatory, for those who think that they don't exist. It is a time in which a lady has been entrusted and empowered by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mission of the Father to help out humanity to get out of the spiritual and moral decadence that is pervading in our contemporary society and is destroying our true dignity and our true greatness. It is a time for a lady to become very visible. That doesn't mean that we're all going to be visionaries. Visible means that we see her working in our lives and in our situations and confronting the devils that we face personally and as humanity. A lady also wants to lead us. That's why she says so many times, I want to lead, lead you to holiness. It's not only to take us away from sin, but to lead us into the path of holiness. Our Lady is coming to give us clarity because she says so many times, Satan wants to bring deception. That means lies. And not only doctrinal lies, lies into your mind. The great battle is taking place here, brothers and sisters. The devil is deceiving. And Our Lady wants to protect us from the dece deceptions of Satan and also she wants to give us protection and she wants to prepare us with the necessary weapons to conquer these fierce battles. Our Lady is supposed to in this Marian era, and I pray that it happens soon, to illumine the consciences of humanity. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine if that happens? to a humanity that is totally immersed in the dictatorship of relativism, as Pope Benedict called it. She's totally and intimately, intimately associated to the providential activity of, of God to conquer the world and every heart for the reign of the Sacred Heart. In our difficult times, Our Lady is being entrusted with the mission of forming new saints and new apostles filled with the spirit of the gospel form in the school of her heart. They are to be the ones to raise up with a Marian spirit, not just any spirit. It's not a, with a strength. It's not with my character and personality. No, it is with the spirit of Our Lady to help her fulfill her mission in these particular dramatic times. We need to sit at the feet of Our Lady, just like St. Catherine of Labouré. 
the Marian era that began with this apparition, you know what I love? That a lady sat down and St. Catherine sat at the feet of a lady and she was instructed of many things sitting at the feet of a lady. That's a prophetic gesture. We are to sit at the feet at the feet of a lady and she's sitting in her maternal Marian chair. Because if there is a Petrine chair, which is particular prerogatives, there is also a Marian chair. Or what do you think? A lady was standing the whole time in the cenacle when he was praying and teaching the apostles? What was she teaching the apostles? The memories that she kept in her heart, which are the complete memories. That's why the, uh, John Paul and Benedict called Our Lady the maternal memory of the church. Isn't that beautiful? That a lady, and I'm gonna, it doesn't go to my talk, but I'm gonna say it. The maternal memories of a lady are enclosed in the Holy Rosary. These are the memories of a lady about Jesus' life and her life with him. Benny the 16th said, when he was asked about the dragon of heresy, apostasy, and relativism, he said in 2007, uh, in 2007, Our Lady has been given to us as the best defense against the evils that afflict mo modern lives. Marian devotion and spirituality is the only protection that we have in these dark times. St. John Paul II in Ecclesia, Ecclesia in Europa, number nine. He warned about the silent apostasy. And he said, I believe that there are many reasons that lead us to discern that this apostasy, this silent apostasy, is getting, uh, reaching culmin its culmination. That was in 2003. Brothers and sisters, we are in 2019. I do not believe that it's silent anymore. So a lady comes to illumine our minds in the darkness of falsehood and deception she comes to destroy Satan, Satan plans, and that's the key of the Marian era. And we need to enter into her, her immaculate heart to be totally immersed in the light of Christ. Sister Lucia said, while she was alive, please obey the petition of Our Lady and pray the rosary every day. And look at the reason why. Because in these times, there will be a diabolical disorientation. Don't you think we're living in those times? Diabolical disorientation. People cannot even think, cannot even reason. It's like they have a fog in their minds. Diabolical disorientation. And she said, we need to be protected from the deception of false doctrines and prevent, impede, that prevent and impede our communion with God and is trying to. Carol Botiwa in 1976, you know this. Here in the United States, he said, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation. When I read it, I shake. I don't know what happens to you. The greatest one that humanity has gone through. And he said, I do not think that white circles of the American society or the world or the Christian communities realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel. This is 1976. Don't you think we're living in it? This prophecy is being fulfilled. This confrontation, he said, 
lies in the plans of divine providence. It is a trial for the church. Yes, brothers and sisters, we are in times of trial. It is a trial, look at this. But in a sense, I can say it's a test to 2,000 years of Christian culture, Christian civilization, with all the consequences for human dignity, individual rights, human rights, and rights of nation. This is 1976 in the United States. In 1974, in Poland, in his Advent address, he said, the moment that we are living requires that we really discern them, that we know what time is it, what hour it is. This is a crucial hour for the present and the future of humanity. I don't know how more clearly he can speak in St. Maximilian Colby. I mean, there's so many prophecies of St. Maximilian Colby, but the greatest prophecy was fulfilled in his own life. He declared, our modern, uh, when John Paul II uh, canonized and declared him the saint of our difficult times, he had a prophetic intuition of the future. And he said, modern times are dominated by Satan and will be more so in the future. The conflict with hell cannot be engaged by men alone, even by the most clever. So this is not a matter of intelligence. Huh? This is a matter of communion with the Immaculate. Only the Immaculate has from God the promise of victory over Satan. She needs our cooperation, he said. She seeks souls who will consecrate themselves entirely to her, who will become in her hands fit instruments to defeat Satan and spread the kingdom of God. The age of Mary is supposed to give us as a fruit the formation of saints and apostles. St. Louis of Montfort said apostles of the later times. You can give whatever name. The thing is apostles for these times. And these apostles were going to be formed with great, great graces. And why do I want to even mention some, brothers and sisters, because this is us. We are the children of Mary. We are living in the era of Mary where she's supposed to form us to become filled with grace and seal. This is not time of med mediocrity. Time of grace, seal, grace, to advance the kingdom of God even against all the obstacles that we face. The children of Mary said, those apostles will be illumined by her light, will be strengthened by her maternal love, will be guided by her spirit, will be supported by her arm, sheltered under her protection. They will fight with one hand and build with the other the civilization of love. With one hand, they will give battle, overthrowing and crushing all that opposes the kingdom of God. And with the other hand, they will build the kingdom of God, the mystical city of God, a new civilization of love, life, truth, and solidarity. They will give witness. It's time of witness, brothers and sisters, by word and by example of our love to Our Lady and our love to Jesus, especially in the Eucharist. These children of, and servants and apostles of Our Lady, says St. Louis, <coughs> will enkindle everywhere they go the fire of divine love. They will carry the goal of love in their heart, the frankincense of prayer in their mind, and the mirror of mortification in their body. Let me say it clearly, prayer, love, mortification. Isn't that what a lady asks wherever she appears? These 
Apostles of Our Lady in these difficult times, in this era of Mary, will crush the head of Satan, not with pride, but with humility, just like her. They will be like sharp arrows. You have to take that. We have to possess that truth. We have to be sharp arrows, piercing the forces of the enemies. Doesn't that sound like the Old Testament? Arise, O oh Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And that's what I feel. You know, the apostles of the later times are to be. They are to be like thunder clouds flying through the air wherever the Holy Spirit leads them. What does that mean? Totally free of attachments to fulfill the work of a lady and do whatever she wants and go wherever she needs us to go. They will thunder against sin. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be children of Mary and allow ourselves to have sin. We have to fight against personal sin so we can fight against the sins of the world. We will have eloquence and, and strength to work wonders. We will not depend on earthly things, not on worldly powers, but in the power of the Immaculate. They will have the cross in one hand and the rosary in the other. These are our weapons, the rosary and the cross. And in our conduct, look at this prophecy, if it's not important for this time. In our conduct, Our Lady wants to form us to be men and women of modesty. And not only in the way you dress, modesty in the way we recollect ourselves, we recollect our senses. We don't allow any darkness within us. In self-sacrifice, ascetical life. People don't speak anymore of ascetical life. Without ascetical life, there's no holiness. And just to finish, because I know my time is almost over. San Luis of Montfort cried, and you can tell in his book, saying, when will this time of Mary come? When will this happy time when a lady will dwell in the hearts of men and women, where she will form living icons of herself, living images? He kept saying, I pray and I pray and I pray for this time to come. I have waited and waited. Thank you, San Luis de Montfort, for praying, praying, and waiting for this time of Mary that he never saw. He prophesied, but he never saw. He's seeing it from heaven now. But he waited, he knew it, he prophesied it. You can go deep in through devotion and read about the era of Mary, and he never saw it. He waited and waited. And brothers and sisters, we are the blessed generation that live what he waited and waited for. We are the children of the era and the time of Mary. May the Lord bless you and our lady keep you in her immaculate heart. Amen.